So we've got a picture here of what a kind of typical euglena phyta looks like. It's a euglena, it's a really nice picture. We'll break it down in a few minutes to all the different parts of it. The flagella on this guy are on this end. This is the anterior end. And this little spine at the end, that's in the posterior. So the direction of movement would be that way more or less, although sometimes it's hard to tell which way a euglena is moving, as you'll see. Phyta, of course, is the division ending. U means good or true. It really means good. I always like to think of it as meaning true. I don't know why, but good typically means. And this word, this root glen, G-L-E-N, means pit or socket. And that refers to the invagination. There's a little cavity that sits down here at the anterior end of euglena. And I'll show you a drawing of that in more detail in a minute. So that's what it's referring to. Where do these guys fit? Here they are. Notice we have a weasel word. It's not euglena phyta here, it's euglenoids. It's an indication that they're problematic organisms. We talked about that the very first day, and you'll see that as we go on here. The euglenoids are then the, essentially the euglena phyta, maybe some related organisms. And what does this mean down here? This thing down here is a, what's called a polychotomy. That doesn't, that does not spell right. Yes, it is. Polychotomy. It means many cuts. This is an example of a dichotomy, which means two cuts, poly many. And you can see the difference there. At the, at the dichotomy, there's only two branches that come off. In the polychotomy, there's many branches that come off. A polychotomy is an indication that we don't know the true phylogenetic relationships. We don't really know where euglena phyta belong in this phylogeny. Now, the fact that the polychotomy is here and not down here means we know something. We know that euglena phyta doesn't belong over here near the bacteria or near the archaea. It doesn't belong in those kinds of places. It belongs higher on our phylogenetic tree. But is euglena phyta really over here? Should it be over here connected as the sister group to the brown algae? Should it be over here in as the sister group coming off like this is a branch near the dinoflagellates and those kinds of things. Should it be over here as a sister group up here to the green and red algae? We don't know for sure. It's got, the molecular evidence is not completely certain on this and the morphological evidence as you'll see is really contradictory on it. So that's a polychotomy. We don't know exactly where it goes, but we've got a rough idea where euglena phyta goes. These organisms are mostly unicellular. Now there is one example we're gonna see that's colonial, but it's colonial in a funny way that is really kind of unicellular also. So unicellular, you're pretty good with that. And they are all mobile with flagella at some point in their life cycle. The ones that are colonial are not mobile for most of their life cycle, but at some point very early on they have flagella. Chlorophyll A and B is present. What other group do you know with chlorophyll A and B? Chlorophyta. This is very significant. There's no starch. Now by starch we mean the starch of the higher plants, the starch of the chlorophyta. There is a separate polymer of glucose called pramelon. Again, it's another linkages between glucose molecules in a slightly different way called pramelon. There are prenoids present. And we know in the green algae, the prenoids are the places where the starch is formed. But pramelon is not formed there. It's formed usually in the cytoplasm. So another one of those cases where our certain knowledge that we need prenoids, these dense 
masses of enzymes. We need those in order to form starch. This is not, not true in euglena phyta. I don't know. I'm not, unfortunately, I'm not a physiologist of euglena phyta. We're back to that specialization thing. And I don't know why, how the prenoids function in these cases. They may function in starch formation, but the starch may be exported. It's certainly not, it's not formed right at that area. The anterior invagination, here it is. There's a cavity at the top of the organism, and that has a canal and a reservoir. There's the canal at this end, and the reservoir is down here at the bottom. So there's a canal and a reservoir. The canal is just a little narrowing then of that cavity. The flagella come out of that, well, the flagella are attached at the bottom of that cavity. And there are two flagella, but you off, well, mostly two flagella. It's always exceptions. They can emerge or they might not emerge from that invagination. And it, so in some cases, you can distinguish genera of euglena phyta by whether the flagella are emergent or not. Now, it's not true. The, the, the general we're going to learn are all have two flagella and one doesn't emerge. But, so it's not going to help us. But there are other genera, and I'll show you an example in a minute, where there are two flagella and they both emerge. The flagella have fine hairs on them. Can you see that up there? There's little, looks a little fuzzy. So if we looked at the flagellum, we would see this. We would see these little hairs along it on the side. It's called a tinsel flagellum. Now, of course, they're not hairs because the flagella is made up of that 9 plus 2 microtubule arrangement. So they're little cytoplasmic projections off the side of the flagellum. And there's an eye spot or a stigma. Stigma, remember, means spot. And I've covered over it here. Let me get another color. There it is, the stigma. The chloroplasts, really interesting stuff about these chloroplasts. You know. They're surrounded by three membranes. How many membranes does a normal chloroplast in the chlorophyta have? It has two. Or in the higher plants, it has two membranes. We got three in this case. And this is a really significant feature about the euglena phyta that tells us something about the euglena phyta and tells us something about the origin of the chloroplast. Yes, we're talking about the process of endosymbiosis. Here was a new slide, a blank, just a blank piece of paper. So, endosymbiosis. Endo, inside. We did this already. Inside life with relationship. So it's a ca case where in the chloroplast, the endosymbiotic theory of the chloroplast, we have two membranes. So we find an outer membrane. I'm going to do another color. And an inner membrane. This is the regular higher plant chloroplast. And that inner membrane is folded into these thalicoid membranes on the inside where the photosynthetic machinery is taken. And I've got two colors used here because by higher plant chlorophyta, both chloroplast, because this outer membrane is similar to the plasma membrane. in com chemical composition. And this inner membrane is similar to a bacterial membrane in chemical composition. So similar to a bacterial membrane. So 
in the higher plant chloroplast, we have a process that we think, or an organelle that we think originated from a process of engulfment. So there was a proto-eukaryotic organism. Here's the organism. This is a proto-eukaryotic cell. And it has that red membrane. And then we have a bacterial cell, a bacterium. And this is a blue-green bacterium. which means it's photosynthetic. And in the process of digestion, um, engulfing and digestion, the process of um, endocytosis, phagocytosis, how about that? Eating, phago means to eat. Cyto is cell, osis is a process. So the process of eating cells, we have the proto-eukaryotic organism surrounding this bacterium, and then comes into food vacuole, and then somehow, it's really kind of magical, over long periods of time, somehow those, some bacteria didn't get digested, but they got incorporated in the eukaryotic cell. And that's what gives us our two membranes that look like that, with the outer membrane being similar to the eukaryotic membrane and the inner membrane looking like a bacterial membrane. And there's lots of other similarities here, lots of other lines of evidence. I mean, you know that both bacteria and organelles have circular DNA. They have circular DNA, we think, because they originated from this process. And this is not just parallel evolution, but it's the fact that they really were engulfed in this way. So what's going on now with the euglenophyta? We've got three membranes. So here's our chloroplast now, brought a little bigger. We've got an outer blue membrane. We've got a inner red membrane, which is similar to a eukaryotic cell membrane. And we have got a inner inner membrane, which is similar to a blue-green algae membrane, and it's got these things in it. What's going on in that case? What's, our, what's the hypothesis? That it's an endosymbiotic event. <coughs> Here, and so that blue membrane then is very similar to the external membrane of the euglena, which is a little, a little bit different than a normal chloroplast membrane, a nor normal chlorophyta membrane. Here. So two endosymbiotic events. to give us our three membranes. Now, there are some interesting consequences of this. You could say, another, or you could put that another way, you could say another line of evidence we have that this is a recent event is the fact that we find we can remove the chloroplast from euglenophyta. So that, let's say you have a line of euglenophyta that is green, that has chloroplast in it, and now you culture it under higher temperatures. Cell divisions will continue in the euglenophyta, but the chloroplast won't divide, and you will get a line of euglenophyta that is perfectly healthy, lives perfectly well, as long as you feed them, has no chloroplast. So we can transform lines of euglena from heterotropic, or let's say from autotropic, to heterotropic. Auto is self, hetero is different. You know those already. Tropic is to feed. So autotrophic self-feeding, heterotropic feeding on something else. Has a heterotropic organism needs an organic source of nitrogen. 
an organic source of food that it has to take in in some way. In heterotrophic organisms, that organic source can be in the form of like food particles, or it could be just dissolved in the organism. Are you saying that that's evidence that it was a recent event? A recent event that you can transform it in this way. And in fact, not only can you transform it, but there are whole lines of euglenophyta. There are whole species which have no chloroplasts. So there are some species with chloroplasts, some species without chloroplasts. So a third kind of evidence. You can transform them. There are, it's a diverse group. So here we got real problems. You're right. We're trying to place this now in a phylogeny, right? Do you place it with groups with chloroplasts or with groups without? Doesn't fit very well in either group. It, doesn't, it just doesn't fit in our classification. It's this hybrid kind of organism. It's not the only one we're going to see this semester either. So it's this organism that's ar arisen from endosymbiosis. But then again, all organisms have probably arisen. All eukaryotic organisms have arisen from endosymbiosis. In endosymbiosis. They've just done it so long ago, so many hundreds of millions of years ago, that it's ubiquitous. Ubiquitous means everywhere that chloroplast organelles are ubiquitous through all eukaryotes. Yes? Um, would it, like, placing it depend on whether, like, I mean, if it was the endosymbiotic event that caused the chloroplast to be in there, then wouldn't it then be placed originally, like, ancestrally without chloroplast? Yeah, that's a... Is there evidence that there's, that's recent? Yeah, so that would be a good argument that you could place it over probably in the um, protista as, although protista don't have flagella like that usually, but you could argue that a protista is a place that it belongs with and it's just a rare protista which has some chloroplasts in it. So yeah, that, and it may end up over there eventually. I think that's a good argument. Okay, no cell walls in this group. There you go, protista argument again. No cell walls, no cellulosic cell walls. It's got a different kind of structure on the outside. So again, here's an argument that suggests that it would not be, again, in the chlorophyta. I'll show you in a minute more what that, in some diagrams, what that outside of the organism looks like without a cell wall, because there's something particular about it. It has a paraplast or a pelisol. Paraplast or pelisol, they're interchangeable terms. And that is a proteinaceous system of grooved strips on the outside of the organism. So this is shown down here at this bottom of this drawing with those grooves running around it. it this will make more sense as we look at some more pictures of it. Right? So they're, just think now there's this series of groove strips that run around it. And we'll look at their structure in a minute. These are inside the plasma membrane. Cell walls are outside. These are inside the plasma membrane. Here we are looking at a euglena, member of euglena in polarized light. And we can see a number of things, but let's stay with these groove strips and you can kind of see them here. This is the pelisol. Can you see purple? No. So those strips on here, here they are very nicely seen down here as the indications of the pelisol. This is pramelon. That starch of the euglenophyta. Here's the anterior end and our flagellum would come out here. We don't see the anterior invagination well. And this little spine is just a cytoplasmic structure. It is not a flagellum. Okay, here's the structure of the pelisol. Here's the bilipid membrane, the plasma membrane. <clears throat> you can see here in this area, there is a system of protein, so this is a proteinaceous layer.
and those proteins allow the outer part of the organism to, uh, to remain in this wavy shape. Right, so that's the pelisol, that's those screw strips you're seeing, that waviness on the outside of the organism. And so it's kind of a semi-rigid structure. That's important that it's semi-rigid because of how the organism moves. And I should have had the, we'll just skip for a minute. That one in, here it is moving. There's a, there's the flagella. Here we can see two flagella. They're both emergent in this case. It's gonna move, but watch. It's not just moving with flagella. Oh, so look at that. See, the organism is changing its shape a little bit there. I'll show you another couple of videos where it does that even more. So it's going through this process of movement by flagellum, but also what's called euglenoid movement or met metabole. It's got the ability to change its shape. I'm going to back up to this slide and just show you some of the different forms that we have in the euglenophyta. We'll come back to these after the break and learn about these organisms a little bit more detail. But here's euglena. And this reminds me that when you're writing the names of these genera, you really have to capitalize the first letter. Most of you did that. Some people on um, the quizzes did not do that. And at least in my section, I've made notes of all of those places. So please be sure you capitalize the first letter. There's your Luglina. This is the genus Phacus. This is a tough one. This is Trechalomonas. I think that's spelled right. E-L, not A-L, Trechalomonas. It's the, these are the genera of these things. We're going to come back to them and, do, and look at them all in more detail. And this is Colasium. Really interesting one that is sessile and colonial. You can see it doesn't have flagella shown there. Just showing you some of the differences in shape. So you see that they're quite, the shapes are quite different in these cases. And in fact, Phacus and Trechalomonas look much more different than those diagrams make them appear. And you'll see that very nicely in lab next week. Cellular structure, we've covered a lot of the things about cellular structure already. The stigma and the reservoir and the tower, the, sorry, the canal and the reservoir, the stigma, the light sensitive spot. Again, there's contractile vacuoles like in many of the unicellular algae, Chlamydomonas especially. There's chloroplasts, paramelon, normal nuclei, et cetera, and the paraplast. And you can see in the electron micrograph, many of these same structures. There's the canal and the invagination. The chloroplast. That's the prenoid there, by the way, that big base chloroplast. And pramelon, I'm not seeing very well, but I think it's probably these. I'm not positive, but I think it's that. Yep, there it is, prenoid. So really not that much strange about the cellular structure except for that invagination and the way the flagella are attached and the fact that pramelon occurs outside the chloroplast. Here it is in that beautiful diagram we saw at the beginning. Again, the flagella, this is the anterior end. The pramelon shows up very nicely here. This is the nucleus. Here's the contractile vacuole. I'll pause so you can catch up. I'm sorry you're having to flip back. This is the stigma. 
lots of pramelon in there. Here's a prenoid. That's mostly what I see. Okay, let's continue looking at Aglinophyta. Here we're talking about that euglenoid movement before. We've got you know, two little videos on this slide. So here's one. I think we saw this at the very beginning of the class. It really shows that euglenoid movement very well. Not getting anywhere with the flagella, but it's moving around a lot by that thing. Also called metaboly. And here you see one of the euglenas without much chlorophyll in it, maybe not a chloroplast at all, and it comes along and it sees something it doesn't like and it just changes direction. So a very like um, kind of amoeboid movement. And so the paraplast is what allows that. They had cell walls, they couldn't move like that. So it does look a lot like a protista with chlorophyll. Reproduction is by mitotic cell divisions. And that's all that this diagram shows. It just shows that the mitotic cell division begins at the anterior end, the invagination, and it continues to the posterior end. But that's not that important for us. What's important is that it is a process of mitotic cell division. As far as I know, there's no sexual cycle known in these organisms. So we're not going to draw out the life cycle because it's basically mitotic cell division. It's asexual reproduction, how they reproduce. So very effective kinds of reproduction, but that's it. So here's our genera. Euglena is the one we've been seeing up until now. So you see, recognize the same drawing. It has, well, in fact, all of the organisms we're going to see have two flagella, all that we're going to be responsible for, and only one is emergent. So what distinguishes euglena then, a visual kind of distinction for us, it's long and cigar shaped. So the other ones are gonna have other kinds of shapes for this. So this is the only one we're gonna see in this class that you're responsible for that has that long cigar shaped structure. Here it is again, even more long and cigar shaped. And this is where the flagellum is out here. There's that single emergent flagellum. Here's the eye spot or the stigma. Let's move toward light. The pramelon has got a little bit of a green cast here. Probably it's reflecting stuff from the chloroplast or maybe that's the chloroplast. Let's say that's, that's probably is the chloroplast. And I don't definitely see the nucleus, so I won't label it. Again, this is just a cytoplasmic extension at the back of the organ, at the anterior end of the organism. Here's euglena compared to distigma. This is distigma over here. It's not one that you're required to know. We sometimes have it living in the laboratory, but it's very hard to see the characteristics of diastigma. It looks like a lot like euglena under the microscope. It's got this swelling at the, around the nucleus, and it's got two, this is one with two flagella, both emergent. But diastigma is not a required organism for us. I just bring it up here to show you some of the differences between very similar organisms. And this is the only one we have any diagram of that shows two emergent flagella. Here's the tinsel flagellum. And that's characteristic of all of the euglena phyta. So it's got those little extensions off the side of it. Here's phacus. You can see the flagellum which means this is the anterior end. And again, there's a posterior spine. There's the stigma. 
So that's up near the invagination, and you can almost see in this area that invagination, the stigma is kind of sitting on top of part of it there. You can see it maybe a little better in the original on your microscope than you can see it on the slide. There's the nucleus. Phacus is really cool because it's a flat organism. You can't tell here, but it's really going to be obvious when you see them swimming. So it's like a flat fish. So you'll see it swimming around under your microscope, and there will, this, there will be this organism swimming around like this, and they'll suddenly go like this. So it's flat. It's really cool to watch. So it's completely flat, and it'll flip on its side like that. So that's very, phacus is very distinctive because of that, its flatness. Here's Trachalomonas. Trachalomonas is not flat. In the drawing, it looks the same, but it's kind of football shaped. So when Trachalomonas turns, I mean, you can see it moving a little bit, but it doesn't flip flat in front of your face. Again, it's got two flagella, one is emergent. You can see in this drawing the invagination or the, um, yeah, the invagination. Here's the stigma. Nucleus. And now there is a new structure that distinguishes trichalomonas. And you see that this is like, this is like the goth. Um, Euglenophyta. It's got little spines here on the front. That's because this area, this is a covering, a non-cellular covering over the top of the organism, and it is called the lorica. It is a non-cellular material that forms a, like a container, a plate around the organism. So lorica means breastplate, and it comes from Latin. It's, you know, in the Middle Ages, they had armor, the knights. Before the invention of gunpowder, everyone wore armor, and these were the greatest fighting men of the time, and every piece of armor had a name. So the lorica is one of those names. It was the part of the armor that you wore across your breast. So this is where the name comes from. It is the breastplate of this organism, the lorica. We see that here a little better in this. It's, I don't like this diagram as well, but it shows the lorica very well. This is the lorica. Acellular material secreted by the organism. You can see inside the lorica here, this is the pellicle. That wavy part, there's the pellicle. So it has the same structure as the other euglenophyta. It's just got this extracellular material on the outside of it. Good question, and I don't know the answer to that. Yep, I don't have that in my notes. It's not cellulose, but I don't know the material offhand. Sorry, we'll try to find that out. You can also see the tinsel flagellum nicely. And I was just showing, about to show you here in the invagination, you can see the two flagella drawn here. One flagella not emergent. So trichalomonas is like that. Is like that a football shaped thing. Colasium is our next organism, and colasium is colonial and sessile. Sessile means settled, non-mobile. So for most of its life, it's, it's a settled organism. It, grow, it may grow very early on. There may be a small phase, a short phase, where there's a flagella in its life cycle. But that organism quickly settles down, and it starts to divide. Now, if we look here, this the red dot is where the organism settled initially. So that one cell settled there and it started dividing. And you can try to trace its set of divisions here. And so, well, it's hard to get find the first division, but you can find, if you follow a branch out, you can see there was an organism there at one time that divided like that. This one that had divided, divided like that. This one divided like that, you see? And if we follow that up, 
we can find probably one of these guys that is recently divided. Well, let's go over here. This one, here's that stalk, and that has recently divided into those two organisms. So they will each continue secreting one of, some of this material, and eventually this cell then will divide, and we will get two new calaceum here divided from the stalk. And I was sure someone was going to ask me what that stalk is made of, and I don't know the answer to that, too. I just checked my notes. You would sure expect if it was cellulose, but I don't think it's cellulose. So calaceum is neat, not just because it has this dichotomous mechanism of growth. You can see mitotic cell divisions give that dichotomous form to our little colony of calaceum, but it's also cool because where it grows. Now, if you were an aquatic organism like this, and you needed a place where it could grow, where there might be lots of nutrients, and you could settle down for life and never have to move again because you couldn't move anymore, where would you pick to grow? A rectum of a damselfly, of course. And that's where some of the clasium grow. They grow not just on the damselfly, they grow in their rectums. So much better nutrients of that. And they're in the larvae. This is the larvae of the damselfly. This is the mature damselfly over here. We're talking about in the larvae of the damselfly because they're aquatic. The mature damselfly is not aquatic. You know damselflies, they're like, you know, you know um, Dragon. dragonflies. Dragonflies have their wings out like this. Damselflies kind of look like dragonflies, except they always fall, they settle with their wings in back of them. Like that. And there you can see that here, the wings of the damselfly are not out straight. They are folded behind it. So closely related to dragonflies and the larvae. So in the rectum of damselflies is one of the places they grow. They also can grow apophytically, so to speak, on crustacea. And so here's your glutophyte you growing on the on crustacea, something like that. They're on the outside. And again, it's those dichotomously branching colonies. So a cool organism. I wish we had calaceum to show you in lab. We do not. No one apparently cultures it. I can't understand why, but they don't. 